message today is from Proverbs, verse 11, sorry, Proverbs 11, verses 24 and 25. For one person gives freely and yet gains even more, yet another withholds unduly but comes to poverty. A generous person will prosper, whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. Amen. When we fail to cultivate generosity, it is easy to isolate ourselves from the natural give and take, and therefore we also experience no give and take. Giving is a way of opening ourselves to opportunities. When we choose to be God's opportunity of help and love for another person, we place ourselves in God's design for giving and receiving. As we prepare to give today, let us reflect on what it means to commit our hearts and finances to the kingdom of God. Let us to read the declaration for today's offering.
celebrate and honor mothers. But it should not just be a once-off, it's a thing we do daily. But for next week's service, especially being Mother's Day, we want to appeal to everybody, if you will be attending the service next Sunday, please do register, give your details to Pastor Sharon. And sometimes when we have events like that, we tend to get more people so that we can manage the numbers in the facility. Amen. Amen. So just remember that next week Sunday, only next week Sunday, so you register for next Sunday service. Now, are you all there in Ephesians chapter 1? And verse number 3, I want us all to read it together on the count of three. One, two, three, go. One more time. This Paul now is speaking to the church at Ephesus and he's speaking to you and I. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us. Who has blessed us. My question is. What tense is that? It does not say who shall bless us or who will bless us. It does not say who is blessing us because is blessing is present tense. And shall or might or will is future tense. But the Bible here says who has blessed us. Has, that means past tense. That means it has happened already. You are not waiting for the blessing to come upon you. Tell your neighbor, I'm not waiting for the blessing to come. It has come. The Bible says, who has blessed us, watch this, with every spiritual blessing, with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, in Christ. That means you are so blessed. It means everything that you desire has already been provided for. Hallelujah. Now he says, where, where are these blessings? In the heavenly places in Christ. Where are we seated? In heavenly places in Christ. Are you with me? In other words, what is what he's trying to say here is that everything that you need, everything that you require, everything that you're going to get in this life has to be taken from the spiritual realm. Amen. You with me? The blessings are in the spirit. Amen. Everything you desire, it's in the spirit. Amen. But it had, in order for it to manifest in the natural, it has to be taken from the spirit. The spiritual realm, watch this, the spiritual realm and the natural realm run parallel. They run parallel. That means everything that I need, I've got to pull from the spirit and take it and bring it to manifestation in the natural. All right? So, what I'm trying to get at is, it's not just going to fall on you. Tell your neighbor, it's not just going to fall on you. Because you have to reach out and take it. Sometimes it's going to require you to stretch yourself to get it. Let me, let me give you an example of your salvation. The day you became saved. Did your salvation just fall on you or did you have to get up, make a quality decision to come to the, to hear the altar call, come to the altar and take it? Amen. Salvation is something God offers. So you saw the offer, you saw what God was offering. But the offering of salvation did not just fall on you automatically. You had to reach out and take it to receive it. 
Hallelujah. Amen. So, if we were to look at, let me give you an example of business people. In order to be successful, any business individual is going to have to go out and take it. If you want to make it, you're going to have to go out and take it. You can't just say, okay, um, I'm a good businessman and you sit in your office and you cross your legs, put it on your desk, put your hands behind your head and say, I know about business, the business is coming. You have to get out and get it. Say amen to that. Amen. amen. Nobody says, even a salesperson, a salesperson who wants to be successful, they have to go out and get it. I mean, look at it, you know, in the old days, um, I remember banks, people would flood to banks. Nowadays, banks are flooding to people. <laughs> There's Sister Carol, she can share with you how they have to now canvas customers. The business is out there. In other words, everything that you need is out there. The success that you desire for your life, it's out there. Are you hearing me? It's out there, so you have to go out and get it. Amen. Hallelujah. What I'm trying to get across to you is that the Bible says that God has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. In other words, God, when God designed man, you have been designed for success. Say that. I have been designed for success. Listen, before you were born again, doing your own thing, your life was a mess. But God offered you salvation, meaning that you healed, saved, and delivered. He gave you salvation. He offered you salvation. He was giving it to you and you took it. At that moment when you took it, God now began to program you. You've been programmed to succeed in life. That means the mistakes you made before, you will not make them again. You've been programmed for success. Can you see that? You've been programmed. Listen, who programmed you? God. And how does he do this? By his spirit and by his word. That's why it's so important. For you and I, as born again children of God, it's so important for us to remain in the Word of God. As you study the Word of God, as you read the Word of God, as you meditate on the Word of God, as you spend time in the Word of God, all of a sudden you find that you begin to get programmed by the Holy Spirit. Your thought, your thought life, your thoughts become in tune and in line with God's thoughts. Your ways, the way in which you behave, the way in which you speak, the way in which you carry out yourself comes in line with the Word of God. You get programmed. So much so that if somebody else were to tell you something that's contrary to the Word of God, you will not compromise it. You will stand on what you believe in because you've been programmed. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody. You know, if you look at a computer, um, once it's been programmed, if it's been programmed against certain viruses, if that, vi if that virus were to try to come or enter that database of that computer, it would reject it because it has an antivirus software against it. God, in His Word, He programs you and I that now Put it this way, you have an antivirus against failure. You have an antivirus against defeat. Come on, you have an antivirus against lack. You have an antivirus against poverty. Talk to me, somebody. That means you cannot fail. The Word of God is your compass. The Word of God is your foundation. The Word of God will never fail. Say amen to that, somebody. Hallelujah. And you now, you have the word on the inside of you. 
You've become one with the Word. You have become the Word. And if you've become the Word, that means you cannot fail. Unless you become like Peter. You see, when they were in the boat, and they saw Jesus walking on the water, and Jesus said, Come. Peter got out of the boat. And as long as he had his eyes on Jesus, he walked on the water. But the minute he took his eyes away from Jesus and he looked at the waves, he began to sink. And many times in our lives, when we find ourselves sinking and we find ourselves falling, we need to question, what are we meditating on? Who are we meditating on? Who are we keeping our focus on? Are we focused on God or are we focused on our circumstances? Let me tell you, if you're going to look at your circumstances, you're going to become conditioned to your circumstances and you're going to find yourself going down and under. But if you keep your focus on God and you keep your focus on the Word of God, you'll stay above the water. You'll stay above the waves. The waves will not move you. Talk to me, somebody. Amen. Hallelujah. So man has been designed for success. And success comes when, a, when an individual realizes what he has, who he is, and what abilities he possesses. Mm. Once you know what you have, I mean, you have the anointing of God. The anointing of God. The anointing is the ability of God. You have the dynamic ability to change things in your life. Now when you realize what you have, listen, that anointing, listen, look at Elijah and Elisha. When Elijah was being taken up, Elisha asked for something. He said, if I can just have a double portion. Hallelujah. And when Elijah was taken up, he dropped his mantle. And Elisha picked up that mantle. But the thing is, listen, the mantle didn't just fall upon Elisha. Elisha had to go and take it. You see that? You've got to go and take it. And once you take it, it's no good. You're just holding it. You've got to put it to work. Elisha then had to pick up the mantle and he went to the Jordan and he struck the waters. Amen. And when he struck the waters, come on, talk to me. He began to speak and he said, where is the God of Elijah? And when he struck the waters, the waters parted. And the prophets that were there, they said, look, the same spirit, watch this, the same spirit that was upon Elijah now rests upon Elisha. Jesus said, hallelujah. He who believes in me, he who believes in me, will do greater works, greater works than these, will who do, will you do. You are the church of God. The church means ecclesia. Ecclesia means that you've been called out. You are called out of God. Hallelujah. Say, I am called out. You've been called out of the world. Called out of the world and into the world. Hallelujah. He said, greater works than these will you do because I go to my Father. And he says, you will receive power. That word power is a word in the Greek, dunamis. It means the dynamic ability to change things. As a child of God, you have a dynamic ability to change things. Can you say that to yourself? Say, I have the dynamic ability to change things. If you don't like what you see, change it. By the power of the Holy Spirit within you, change it. Amen. Hallelujah. So once an individual realizes what he has, who he is, you're the son, you're a son, a child of the Most High God. When you realize who you are, and when you realize what abilities you have, then then you are able to be successful. Hallelujah. Because now you begin to take those abilities and you begin to surround yourself with people who have the abilities in the areas where you are weak. Come on somebody. 
I mean, with business people, you'll find a business person does not know everything about the business. There are certain things that they are strong in. And they are focused, listen, they focus on their strengths. And the things that they are weak in, they'll get somebody else to cover that. It's like a businessman that knows, you know, he knows the trade, he knows what to do. The physical part of it. But when it comes to like the financial part, or the managerial part, they can't do that. They get somebody to do it for them so that the business can thrive. Even so it is with our spiritual lives. Hallelujah. You're going to surround yourself with people of faith. Not doubters. If you're going to have too many Thomases in your life, you never ever going to receive. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. You don't need a Thomas. Praise God. Now I want to ask you a question. When you hear the word, like I said this morning, the topic is it's time to take it. If I give you the word take, what comes to your mind? What do you envision? You envision a hand reaching out towards something. Not so. If, if that word take, to take, what does it mean? It means to reach out. It means to stretch forth. It means to grab a hold of. So when you hear that word take, you see something and you see a hand reaching out to take it. Jesus. You know, let me share something with you. You know, there's many translations of the Bible. And it doesn't matter which translation you use. Whether you use the King James Version or the New King James, or you use the Amplified, or you use the NIV, or you use the Passion, or you use the Message, regardless of which translation you use, there are 32,000 promises in the Bible that God has already provided just for you. We've read in Ephesians 1 verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has already blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Come and talk to me. The Bible says all the promises of God in Christ have their yes, and in Christ have their amen. That means 32,000 promises that God gives you, that God has provided for you. Now my question is, these 32,000 promises that are in Christ, who have they been provided for? Certainly not for the angels. Come and talk to me. The promises are for you and I. The promises are given to the church of Christ, the Ecclesia of Christ, the called out ones. As long, listen, when Israel dwelled in Egypt, everything that happened to the Egyptians did not happen to the Israelites. Because the Israelites had God's word to stand on. The nation of Israel had God's word to hold on to. Even when they went out of Egypt and they went to all the other nations, all the other nations came to hear about this God who is with his people. All the nations began to hear about how this God has spoken concerning his people. That, listen, when God speaks concerning your life, there's nothing that the enemy can do to, to take it from you. Concer listen, even in the days of Herod, King Herod, when the wise men came and they announced that they are looking for the king, and they followed the star. They announced to King Herod. And Herod began to find out. And then it was told to him about the one who would be born to deliver the people of God. Amen. And what did Herod do? He got angry. He plotted. 
even said to them, oh, once you found a child, bring that word to me, so that I too may go and worship him. His, his plan was not to go and worship. His plan was to destroy, was to wipe out the life of that child. In other words, the plan was to destroy the word, to destroy the promise. Hallelujah. And after he found out that, you know, the wise men promised to come, but they did not come. He then decided to go and kill every male child in the age of two and younger. So it is, when God has given you a word, when God has given you a word, you're holding on to the word so much so that you start telling everybody about the faith that you have, about the promise that God has given you, because that is God's word to you. And then you'll find the enemy will do whatever he can to strip you of that word because he knows if he can take that word from you, he'll take your faith from you. And when you don't have faith, you've got nothing to hold on to and you're an open target for him. Hallelujah. Say, I'm not letting go. Hallelujah. We all know John 3 verse 16, for God so loved the world, for God so loved you that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever would believe in him should not perish but would have everlasting life, eternal life. When God gave Jesus for you, when God gave you Jesus, he gave you all he is, all that he has, and all that he has done for you. I'm going to say that again. When God gave you Jesus, he gave you all that He is. He is your peace. He is your comfort. He is your strength. He is your healer. He is your provider. He is your savior. He is your Lord. He is your God. He is your King. He is your life. He is everything to you. So when He gave you Jesus, He gave you all that Jesus is, all that Jesus has. Because Jesus said, hmm, He gave to the church authority. What did He say to His disciples? All authority has been given to me. Go ye therefore and make disciples of all, of all the nations, of every nation, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Talk to me, somebody. Hallelujah. All that he has. He gives you all that he has and he gives you all that he has done. He gives you, listen, the healing that Jesus took for you at Calvary, he gives that to you. The victory that Jesus won for you at Calvary, He gives it to you. Talk to me. The curse that should have come upon you, Jesus took upon Himself so that the blessing of Abraham may come upon you. Say amen to that. Amen. Hallelujah. Now that is what has been given to the church. Go with me to the book of 2 Peter chapter number 1. 2 Peter 1. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. 2 Peter 1. When you're there, you say Amen. Hallelujah. 2 Peter 1, verse 3. Hallelujah. He says, According as His divine power has given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness according as his divine power has given to us all things somebody say all all, all things that pertain to what that pertain to life life that word life is the Greek zoe 
which is a higher form of life, which is a God kind of life. A life that is above this natural life. So he's given you all things that pertain to Zoe. That's God's plan, is that you have his life. Let me ask you a question. Is there anything that can saturate the life of God from God himself? Is there anything that can take the life of God? Is there anything that can take the life of God and place it under its control? No. God is life. He is life itself. Life is in him. And now he's taken that life that he has, that eternal life, and he's given it to you and I, so that we can live our lives above the storms of this life. Talk to me. That life causes you to fly above the storms. You are never under the storm. You are always above. He carries you on eagle's wings. Hallelujah. So all things that pertain to life and godliness have been given to you and I. Say amen to that. Amen. Now, I want you to notice again the word has. Has means past tense. Meaning it has happened already. You're not waiting for it to happen. Tell somebody, I'm not waiting for it to happen. It has happened. Hallelujah. You know the amazing thing is that God has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness, yet we still find ourselves whining, groaning, moaning, complaining, and crying. You find many times, you know, people will say, I just don't know what to do. I just don't know what life has in store for me. I just don't know because, listen, the devil has me. The devil has you? The devil doesn't have you. God has you. Talk to me, somebody. You do not belong to the devil. You belong to God. Satan can try what he wants, but he will not defeat you. All that has been given to Jesus is in the palm of the Father and no one is able to pluck them out of his hand. You are in the hands of God. Hallelujah. Say I'm in the hands of God. Amen. God is working on me. Come on, say that God is working on me. Amen. That means your life is not torn up. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Now, the fact that God has already given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness means that there comes a point where you have got to take it. There comes a point when you've got to take it. You can, you can do one of two things. You can either sit back and you can watch you can just watch the promises that God has given them to you. You can sit back and you can watch and say, Oh, won't it be nice? Won't it be nice? And that's why you find many people, they say, Oh, you know, one day when we leave this earth and we go to heaven, it will be, you know, it will be better than the... Let, let me tell you something. Yes, it is better than where we met. But that is not all. Listen, that is not all. It's good to think that there's a life that's better than this life. It gives you something to look forward to. But many of us need something now. Because you're facing the storms now. You're going through the challenges now. You're going through the fire now. So you need something for now. You're looking forward to them, but you need something for now. That's why you get to a point where you say, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. It 
means that you get to a point where you've got to take it now. We say the Lord's Prayer, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done where? On earth as it is where? In heaven. So you can experience some heaven in your daily life. You can experience some heaven here. Talk to me, somebody. I mean, look at Jesus when he was in the wilderness with the multitude. I mean, there was nothing there. And he says this to his disciples, I have compassion upon the crowds, for they've been with me all day. Then you get the disciples. You see, if you're going to hang around these type of people, you ain't going to get nothing in your desert. Send the people away so that they can get something to eat. You see that? Send the people away. You're not going to get a, you're not going to get a taste of heaven. Then you get the other one that says, Lord, 200 denarii worth of bread is not enough for so much. It means, what he's saying is, we have, yes, we've got money here, it's about six months worth of wages. But if we take the six months worth of wages, what is it among so many? And then you get the one that says, Master, there's a young boy here with a few loaves and a few fish. And Jesus says, bring them to me. You see that? What you have is not important. What is important is whose hand what you have is in. Amen. Got it? What you have is not important. What is important is whose hand what you have is placed in. You see, you can look at your own life and you say, but I am just a nobody. I am just a nothing. Well, you know what? God is a specialist at making somebodies out of nobodies and making something out of nothing. That's the God we serve. Hallelujah. So it's not important. Your status is not important to God. How big you are, how young you are, that's not important. What is important is, is your life in His hand. When you get to a point where you say, Lord, my life is in your hand. That means you are getting to a point where you say, Lord, I trust you regardless. Lord, I don't care what happens, I'm going to trust you. Lord, I don't care how high the waves may blow, I'm going to look at you. I'm going to look to you. I'm going to trust you. I'm going to walk towards you. I'm going to draw closer to you. I'm not looking around me. I'm not looking to see who's with me. I'm not looking to see who left me, who abandoned me. No. Lord, I know that you said you'll never leave me, nor will you forsake me. I'm looking to you. I'm looking to Jesus, the author and the finisher of my faith. I'm not looking to the left. I'm not looking to the right. I've got my mind focused on Jesus. Hallelujah. Sister Jones, Sister Dolly, when she did us in praise and worship this morning, she reminded us about the words of God to Joshua. Where he said, Moses, my servant is dead. But as I was with Moses, so shall I be with you. And then he says in Joshua 1 verse 8, This book of the law shall not depart from you. Come and talk to me. God's commandment to Joshua was, Joshua, don't look to the left, don't look to the right. But keep your focus on my word. Keep your eyes gazed on my word. Keep your eyes fixed on my word. Keep your eyes focused and fixed on the promise. Don't look to the left or to the right because you're going to stumble. Hallelujah. But God is saying to his church, as you saw how I was with my son Jesus upon this earth, so am I with you. Remember the words of my son. I will never leave you comfortless, but I will come to you. I will send you another helper, another helper. The words there is Elos Parakletos. It means another of the same kind. He says, so shall I be with you. Then he says to you, as the rain and 
the snow fall from heaven and water the earth and cause it to bring forth and bud, so shall the word be that proceeds from my mouth. It shall accomplish the purposes where to I sent it. What has God said to you? What has God promised you? If you can look at the rain, I mean, when there's no rain, we see how nations are turned to God. How nations humble themselves before God. Because it's only God who can give you the rain. There's no government that can give you the rain. There's no society or institution that can give you the rain. There is no body that can give you the rain except the Lord God. He is the God who gives the rain. And God says to you this morning, no matter what your circumstances, no matter what your situation is, I give you my words. And my word will come to pass. It will come to pass. Talk to me, somebody. It will come to pass. The word of God says he has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Receive what God has for you today. The Bible says, La Roshaha, Rebo Bashia da Kurabaha de Babasu, Ben Roboshia Krama Besu Ramashaha, Sire Mando Prahisa da Babrosha Kastaha. Up to now, from the days of John the Baptist up to now, from the days of John the Baptist up to now, the kingdom of God suffer violence. The violent take it by force. You've got to be audacious with your faith. You've got to be strong with your faith. You've got to be a somebody that's going to say, I don't care what I'm going to. I don't care if it costs me my dignity. I don't care if it costs me my reputation. I don't care if it costs me everything. I don't care what it costs me. But I'm going after the promise. I'm holding on to the promise. The thing, the problem we have with the church today, it's easy for people to say, I'm a Christian. But the problem we have is that those who call themselves Christian, the grasp that they have on the promise is weak. The hold that they have on the promise is weak. It's weak because they focus on everything that's happening around them. We become like Peter. What caused Peter to sink? There were two things that caused Peter to sink. Two things. Number one, Peter felt the wind blowing. He felt it. And sometimes in your life, you go through things and you feel the wind. You cannot see it, but you feel it. Hallelujah. So he felt it. He felt how the waves began to become boisterous. He was walking on the water, but in all of a sudden he, he felt how the wave hit his thigh. And he felt how it hit the star. And it kept on hitting him from pillar to post. The Bible says that we be not children to be tossed to and fro. It's time you grew up in the things of God. Don't be a child tossed to and fro with every wave of doctrine, with every teaching. Let me tell you something. There's only one gospel and there's only one Lord. And his name is Jesus. There's only one gospel. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. There's power in this gospel. 
So Peter felt how the waves were, were beating against his legs. And all of a sudden, he began to know that he, he like came to himself now, to his natural self. Remember, when he stepped out of the boat, he stepped into his supernatural self. The part of him that was born to do the impossible. To accomplish the unimaginable. I mean, you think to yourself. I mean, if you go on a boat cruise or you go on a ferry, whatever it is, but you get to the middle of the ocean or you get to the middle of the dam and you get out of the boat and you start walking on the water. I mean, think to yourself, that is something that even, man, science cannot even explain it. Because science has taught us that there's a law of gravity. And the law of gravity says, what goes up must come down. So when you're top of the water, you've got to come down because you're heavier than the water. But let me tell you, when you step into your supernatural self, you begin to do the supernatural. You begin to do the unimaginable. But when Peter allowed himself to step out of the natural, out of the supernatural, and into his natural self, because naturally he was a fisherman. He was a fisherman by trade. He understood. Many a time he went, he spent a night, an entire night on the ocean to go and fish for a living. And he's seen many a ship break. He's seen how, when he caught fish, because of the winds, how the fish broke through the nets. That's why when Jesus was walking by and Jesus saw the disciples, the Bible says they were mending their nets. And Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. You see what he says to you? I'm going to make you someone supernatural. I'm going to take you out of the class that you're in now. And I'm going to put you in a godly class, in a godly race, in a godly generation, in a godly family, in a godly home. But you see, Peter came to his natural self and he focused on the natural. Felt it, number one, he felt it. And then number two, he saw, he saw the effect of the wind. You cannot see wind, but you can see the effect of wind. Jesus. Come and talk to me. You cannot see wind. You can't see wind. There's no one that can see wind. What you see is the effects of the wind. You see how the trees sway. You see how the leaves and the branches are swaying in the wind. That's the effects of the wind. So he began to see what the wind was doing on the ocean. And once he saw that, he was no more looking at Jesus, but he was looking at the natural. And then he began to sink. You see, it's the same with the Holy Spirit. You cannot see him. But you can feel his presence. You can feel his presence in your life. You can feel it. You can feel his presence. And you just know that he's with you. You can feel the presence of the Holy Spirit. You can't see him. But you can see the effects that he has on your life. You can see it because when you see now, the things you used to do, you do them no more. The things you used to say, you say them no more. The ways you used to walk, you walk there no more. Hallelujah! That's the effects of the Holy Spirit. You see him at work in your life. Hallelujah! You see how he saves you. 
You see how you are almost in an accident, a fatal accident, but you saved. You see how you are diagnosed with a terminal sickness or terminal disease which are meant to terminate your life, but you see how the same spirit of him who raised up Jesus from the dead, who dwells in your mortal body, begins to quicken your mortal body. You rise up from that bed. Hallelujah. You rise up from that sick bed.
today. You don't need to question it. You don't need to listen to the lies of the devil and start questioning whether God loves you or God doesn't love you. Listen, God loves you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Whosoever should believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You can look and you can see the cross of Jesus Christ. You can look and you can see Jesus suspended between heaven and earth on the cross. And you can hear the words that Jesus cried out from, from that cross. His last words. It is finished. It is
In fact, he offers you, he offers you things that are far above what you could ever comprehend or think or ask. He offers that to you. And it's to everybody. It's available to everybody. But the truth of the matter is, is that there are those who are lazy. And then there are those who are determined. There are those who are willing to pay the price. That's the difference. That's the difference. This is the common shape that we want to offer you in Proverbs 11 chapter. There's one who keeps and there's one who scatters. There's one who will cling to his old self, but there's one who will let go and let God. Everybody was meant to be successful. Irrespective of your circumstances, irrespective of your upbringing, it's available to everybody. You get people who say, yeah, but it's not for everybody. Yeah, those are the ones that have never been prepared to pay the price. I think there's a gentleman that I know. He worked in a furniture retail business for many years until he stepped out. He started his own little a little shop, a little store. And everybody wondered, he looked at this guy, they thought, man, but this guy's crazy. You, you know, you're leaving a steady income and you're going to do something. But you know, and then they said, but you know there's many people Many people fail in business. You know why many people fail? It's because not everybody is prepared to get up early. Not everybody is prepared to get out of the bed when it's cold and go off to open shop. Not everybody is prepared to work those long hours while others are sitting at home covered with blankets, enjoying the heater. This individual is out there in the cold, trying to make it happen for his family. It's those type of people that make it. Because they don't quit. They don't cower. They don't give in. They don't give up. Whatever the cost. Even in our spiritual life, people look at me and say, "But you know how come? You know how come those people? How come? It's because those people are prepared to get up when it's cold and make it to church. Those people are prepared to get up when it's cold, go on their knees and pray. Those people are prepared to take up the word of God and start reading the word of God, study the word of God instead of reading the newspaper and instead of listening to the news on the TV. Those people are prepared to pay the price."
Thank you, Jesus. It's time to take it. It's time to take it. Say that. It's time to take it. Uh, come on, say it like you mean it. It's time to take it. Tell your neighbor, I don't know about you. But as for me, the time has come for me to take it. I seize the promise from me. Because everything has been given to me by God, my Heavenly Father. Christ Jesus has given me all things that pertain to life and godliness. Satan cannot take anything from you. If he's taking, he's stealing. Let me just give you a closing statement. A closing thought, food for thought. Let's say as you go home now, this is not happening. I'm just illustrating something. If you're driving towards your house and you find a van that you don't know, you've never seen before, park in your property, and you see foreigners, strangers that you don't know, carrying your possessions out of your house and putting them in that van. You would tell me you're going to keep quiet. It's only a foolish person that will keep quiet and watch what's happening. A person in their right mind, take note, a person in their right mind, they know it's their property. They know that those people are trespassing. They have no right to be there. So they'll ask them, excuse me, what on God's green earth do you think you're doing here? What do you think you are taking up? Do you know whose stuff that is? Do you know whose house this is? This is mine. Get out! Smith's Wigglesworth told a story of a woman that was on her way to work. She was going to the bus stop to catch a bus. And as she was going, the dog followed. And she kept saying to the dog, please go home. Go home. I'll see you later. Go home. And then the dog would begin you know, licking her and, you know, pushing against her legs. And she said, go home. And then the bus was coming. The bus was nearly there. It was time for her to go. She spends time with the dog. She'll miss the bus. And then she said to the dog, the tone changed now. It was no more go home. It was, get home! Then the dog's tail was no longer wagging, but it was between its legs. The dog hurried off home. What am I trying to say? Exactly what I've illustrated. Don't allow Satan 
to steal what God has already given to you. He gave you life. He gave you health. He's given you all things that pertain to life and godliness. He's given you joy. He's given you peace. If Satan tries to take that from you, he's trespassing. You tell him, you're trespassing. You're not allowed yet. You're not allowed in this bus. This bus is for me. You're not allowed in this home. This home is for me. Are you getting that? Are you getting that? You see, too many people, they, you know, they converse with the enemy and they just put up with it. No. What are you to avoid when you put your foot down and say, enough is enough. Get thee behind me. Go. Hallelujah. Go. Vocalize your faith. Take it. Amen. Praise God. Let us say, come on, give the Lord a praise. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Father, we thank you. We bless you. We praise you. We exalt you. We exalt your holy name. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your promises, oh God. Father, we thank you for giving us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Thank you for having blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that as we go forth from this place, your presence is with us always. Thank you that you never leave us, nor do you forsake us. Thank you that you never disappoint us. Thank you, Lord, of oh God, for your promises. Thank you for the Holy Spirit. Thank you for the wonderful life you've given us in Christ Jesus, your Son. Now, oh Lord, I pray for your people. Lord, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the love of God, and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with each and every one of your people, both now and for 